Welcome to New York City. This is the Tandon School of Engineering at NYU, and we are here at the Brooklyn 6G Symposium 2023. And I am here with uh, Professor Sandeep Rangan, who is the director of NYU Wireless. I'm also here with Peter Vetter, who is the president of core research at Bell Labs, Nokia Bell Labs. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the research going on that could eventually lead to 6G. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Rangan to start. Um, what kind of things are you working on here at the at the uh, Tandon School of Engineering at NYU Wireless? All right. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Uh, by the way, I'm just the associate director. I'm director and talk about associate that. director. No worries. Um, so we're working on a number of projects, some of which are in collaboration with Nokia and uh, other affiliate sponsors. So we we are uh, we worked a lot in the sub terahertz spectrum, where mm -hmm. we have frequencies above 100 gigahertz. Um, I call it Ted Rappaport or something like this. We're also now looking a lot more into the upper mid band, which is an area that a lot of the carriers have been uh, expressing an interest in. Um, on top of that, uh, there's been a lot of work Nokia's done much more in this area on non-terrestrial networks, integration with satellites, because that's been one of the really, while there's been a lot of developments in the cellular space, the satellite space has just boomed, particularly with Starlink. Mm -hmm. And I think this will be a way to try to figure out how to integrate that. Plus a lot of innovation in the core network itself. So we're looking in areas like mobile edge computing, similar to what a lot of other people are working at. Here in Tandon, we have the benefit of um, having a lot of uh, other users of the wireless. So we have users, for example, in robotics, professors in medical, in wearables, and all of these we're looking at experiments and trying to understand of the role of um, uh, um, edge computing and also a lot of those use AI services that would run through wireless networks. Now, how would uh, so someone in, in medicine might want to use this technology? Yeah, so we have a couple of projects with the School of Medicine. One is actually with Professor J.R. Rizzo, and he builds wearables for visually assist for visual assistance. He works with blind patients, mm -hmm. and so this is in this case a jacket that would have cameras on them, and then basically you would want to use those cameras to provide visual feedback to that blind person. But that requires now and also conversational AI, for example, for them to describe the scene and to help them navigate. But these require very intensive processing because the neural networks for these are very large. So you want to run these in the clouds, and then the connectivity becomes valuable. And that's where the benefit is. And you find that the, the cellular connectivity is, is what you need to, to, make, to make that, as opposed to, say, Wi-Fi or anything else? People can be in any environment, and that's really been, as, you know, as anybody who uses cellular today, which is pretty much, any, pretty much everyone with a smartphone, of course, mm -hmm. the benefit is that you get it everywhere. And a person who will need navigation assistance everywhere. Just like you use Google Maps right now, a blind person would need something equivalent wherever they are. So that's the benefit of cellular connectivity. And Peter, why don't you tell us uh, some of the research that's going on at Nokia Bell Labs? Yeah, so at Nokia Bell Labs, we defined the research for 6G already four years ago in 2019 because we do things 10 years ahead of uh, the, the horizon of 10 years and we expect commercial deployment in 2030. And to, to, to keep it simple to, to, to remember, we re defined six research directions for 6G. <laughs> Somehow makes it easy, right? So uh, first of all, there is new spectrum technology, one hand. So perhaps, but then even more importantly for us, the upper mid-band. Then two, uh, AI. Probably one of the most uh, important reasons to define a new generation, a new technology that we want to reap the benefits of AI for the automation of the network, but also AI at the air interface. Then three, uh, use the network not only as a communications means, but also as a sensor. We will have a radio around us, so ubiquitously we can use radar-like technologies to get information about what's happening in the real world. Four, extreme networking. Uh, going to uh, specialized network requirements that go beyond the 5G ultra-reliable low latency, even 10 times better. 100 microsecond latency uh, with reliabilities of six to nine nines. And then to really benefit from all these capabilities, we need a cognitive cloud 
network architecture. That is number five. And then six, last but not least, make that happen with security and trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, you mentioned radar-like uh, sensing. I don't know if you use the word sensing, but you use some you use radar light. Can you tell us what what is um, what is going on in that area and what might come out of it? Yeah. So so with with radar, everybody knows radar from how we detect airplanes and, uh -huh. and how the police detects cars and even speed, right? Uh, so same technology you can actually use with six, future six G uh, base stations. So it, it, these are radio signals that are sent out, reflected back of you, of the body, and, and coming back. And with that information, you can uh, get information about location of humans and objects, and even course shape, so uh, and, and even speed. So we've we've done first the proof of concept, actually shown that at Mobile World Congress uh, this year, uh, where we hacked a twenty-eight. Uh, gigahertz millimeter wave system to then detect the back reflected si signal and with say a foot of accuracy that localized people but further research to come there uh, use AI to deduce also higher meaning so not only where people are but also uh, there's, there's a certain frequency heart rate oh the, the object must be a mammal or a human uh, there is a, a rotating fan that has a certain frequency air, a signature of a, a piece of equipment, and, and even gesture recognition. I can mm -hmm. use my arm to command the, the tra trajectory of a, of a drone, for instance. So there, there's lots of possibilities with that radio uh, sensing. But the clue is we're not reinventing radar to make it happen with wireless base stations that at the same time provide quality of service communication. Um, Sandy, uh, are, are you doing some of that uh, some of that work as well? Yeah, definitely. I forgot to mention the sensing. And one of the really valuable aspects of the sensing for radar signals, of course, uh, unlike cameras, that they can also go beyond line of sight. So one of the projects we're working on is for robotic navigation, where maybe a target, let's say a first responder, is needs to um, is down, and then you need to locate that person through their 5G signals or any other radio frequency signals that can be transmitted, and we can navigate to that person. Kind of an extension of a lot of localization work, which you know, companies had already put in a significant effort in improving, and so these are super valuable uh, services. You're already using a lot of localization today um, with Nokia and other vendors' equipment, but these will like, definitely enhance it. Peter, you mentioned something about, I'll go beyond ultra low latency, which we've been hearing about for the last 10 years or so. Uh, but you had talked about latency even better than what 5G was built to do. And in a previous talk, you talked about something, I guess you could call it machine area networks, or somehow, you know, I guess you could call it hyper local, maybe, something like that. Can you explain what uh, what kind of work you're doing there? Yeah, so that, that is really clue to get to these very high uh, reliabilities and extreme low latencies. You don't need that in the wide area network. Mm -hmm. But in a, as an example, a machine area networks uh, where machines collaborate and cooperate, you, you, there you need these critical low latencies. And in an area of 100 yards, you can achieve actually the 100 microsecond latency. You can leverage the fact that it's short distances, you can leverage the fact that it's a low power transmission so that you can, the different devices that you're exploiting there can be um, low power consumption also and, and do a better interference uh, cancellation. There's other types of networks that we will see in the 6G era as well. Uh, in machine area network, in car area networks, in body area networks, um, we call them generally in X, so mm -hmm. specialized local mm -hmm. area networks, uh, leveraging that short distance capability and optimizing for the uh, spectrum latency for the specific applications. There's many local area network technologies already today, so you, like Bluetooth and, and Wi Fi, but they mostly use unlicensed spectrum. The opportunity here is to really get to these extreme. Uh, requirements to use the license spectrum and optimize 
the operation of the local network with also the wider area network. So do you envision this, these local or machine area networks being uh, used at millimeter wave frequencies, higher, lower? Where do you think they, they would fit? Co conceptually, they can uh, fit, fit any frequency range. You, you, you're mainly leveraging the fact that it's local. Uh, that uh, there's maybe only one anchor device that needs to be mobile. The other devices that are subtending are, don't need to be mobile. You leverage the fact that it's short distance, that it's low power, that the other devices, will, but maybe there are sensor devices, that you can really uh, ex expl exploit them at a, the, of nearly zero energy. So that is what you're exploiting. It, it, the spectrum, that will uh, dictate how much bandwidth you need. And, and for the control, we don't really expect a high bandwidth. When it comes to, to sensors, maybe yes, you need to deploy that at scale. But conceptually, any uh, spectrum uh, range is, is applicable. Okay. Um, Cindy, uh, does NYU Wireless collaborate with industry or with other universities? And if so, how? Yeah, so the NYU Wireless uh, model is actually, we work closely with a number of affiliate companies. Nokia is one of them, but several other players, Ericsson, Qualcomm, and uh, others, who sponsor and collaborate in research across the spectrum in, the, in terms of industrial robotics, for example. That's one of the uh, projects that we definitely work on, um, but uh, really at all other all uh, parts of the stack. So that's, we've learned a lot from working with the industry and tries to keep us, uh, you know, what focused on what problems are relevant and hopefully find some impact for the work. Okay. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and uh, I look forward to seeing you again. And for EE World, I'm Martin Rowe. Thank you for watching.